Where are we? Oh my God. <laughs> Broadly, that's the subject of this talk, regarding the intersection of art and socially engaged environmentalism. But let's begin specifically and locally at a place you can and should see. So I was going to say, from a vantage point of what work of environmental art are we viewing our city's extant axis mundi? All right, some of, some of you know, but I'll explain it uh, in a moment. The fact that mm, I would bet, even though we have a few adventurous souls calling it out, I bet that few can identify this locale within maybe just less than an hour of here by subway and foot, even though it has been illustrated since August 1 in a substantial survey exhibition up at Wave Hill, corroborates the experience of many of the artists I will show uh, that according to the art world, environmentalist work is is still largely invisible. We have come to see this work not only because it is, it is in, on the wave, in the Wave Hill show in what I will call environmentalist art by artists concerned about the deterioration of the climate due to global warming and or wanting to promote greater attention to and care of the natural world but also because its designer, the New York sculptor George Trakas, has worked since the 70s in that nexus between installation, land, and public art. Here is his Union Station, built as part of the 1975 group exhibition Projects in Nature at a private rural estate, estate in rural New Jersey. Two raised bridges, one slatted wood and one steel, snaked through the forest at angles from each other. At their intersection, Trachus de detonated dynamite, deforming their convergence and leaving a pit that filled with another substance, water. The catalog quotes Trachus on his intention to manifest the contrast in materiality of the two bridges and to reveal more explicitly the elements that, uh, and the substructure of the soil. A wonderful example of 70s cerebralized art speak. In nature, but not really about it. The true trajectory, trajectory suggests an attraction of opposites gone explosive. Let's also analogize that dialectic as about the convergence of art and social change that is exploding into myriad forms of a green aesthetic. But now we're in northern Brooklyn, ground zero of New York's emerging artists, near the intersection of Greenpoint Avenue and Humboldt Street, where 30 years later, George Traka's quarter-mile Newtown Creek Nature Walk was commissioned by the Department of Cultural Affairs Percent for Art Program and built in 2007 by the New York City's Department of Environmental Protection in conjunction with an upgrade of the wastewater treatment plant. Here, circular perforations on the right side, over here, become portholes to view the plant, and the wall itself is actually bowed, these, uh, mimicking those of the ships built along the shore of the East River in Greenpoint during the 19th century. These pictures were taken on a sweltering afternoon last August, the fourth warmest summer in the 131-year Goddard Institute of Space Studies Analysis when the heat seemed to reverberate off the cement. The sense of spatial compression prompted by those high walls and around the corner, this is this, up around the corner is this, okay, those, th those walls of the echelon of enormous concrete cubicles, something like a rough Donald Judd cereal piece containing heaps of sand and pebbles reminded me more of visiting Michael Heiser's double negative in another hot as hell day almost 20 years ago, being within dissertation research and Trizer Heiser's open trough cut into the boulders of the mesa, except that then the heat was supposed to be that unbearable in the Nevada desert in August. Likewise, though, Trachus's piece is in a wilderness of an industrial sort into which sewage has been dumped 150 years. Around another corner, uh, steps lead down to the water, this view, so, so polluted that a month ago today, Newtown Creek was declared a Superfund site. 
but we can instead immerse ourselves in the awesome amount of auto body ruins on the barge uh, uh, contractors here across the way. Let's see if I can get this moving up. Uh, uh, that's the next view here. We want to go over this way, move this in a little, okay. Here we have a little very small tree down here, okay, and then the, then the, bar, the barge and the, all the old cars uh, up over back over here. All right. At the far end is a huge granite a table in the shape of a ballard, the, the cylindrical post used to secure ships. And at the top we have a etching of the Newtown Creek's original watershed before the Europeans came. And the etching has a slight gradient so that when the rain comes, the falling rain will replicate the journey of the creek. And other tables, as in here, have Indian place names used by the early Lenape indigenous to the area, angled to point to the place that identifies, and other post, posted text educate about the area. Nothing here confronts the conditions that created the municipal and industrial abuse of this waterway. So it also calls to mind Robert Morris's complaint 30 years ago after participating in the 1979 exhibition Earthworks, Land Reclamation as Sculpture, that artists shouldn't facilitate industry's ravaging of the earth by agreeing to follow behind and aestheticize messes. So just outside of Seattle in a former gravel pit, Morris cut off the stumps of trees the trees to stumps to refuse the romance of nature. But the savagery of those stumps turns upside down George Innes's bright pain to the train about 120 years ago in this scene this is from about Scranton, Pennsylvania, where, where here, a youth relaxes midst the remains, admiring the railroad roundhouse as the painting's commissioner at the train company hoped this painting would entice you to, to appreciate the train. But being utilitarian is central to the ethos of much of current environmentalist art. The website for the Newtown Creek Nature Walk describes it as, quote, a good place to explore and learn about wastewater treatment, harbor water quality, and the history of New York City. And if that isn't enough, if you want something visually and experientially stirring, something like Heiser and Morris's attention to the sculptural dramas of scale and mass, look across the water to the wastewater settling tanks rising out of urban detritus like an apparition of giant ribbed perfume bottles. Considering Trakas's environment as soft environmentalism presents the challenge to artists and all of us that prompted this question of tonight's topic. Let's accept that anthropo anthropogenic global warming, that is, excess human-produced emissions of carbon dioxide, producing an environment in disequilibrium, rising sea level, eccentric weather patterns that can only be described as both severe and chaotic, except that they are st steadily hotter, will be the major life quality crisis for the rest of our lives. As it continues to be in New Orleans, even after the water receded. In Russia, where this summer's forest fires and severe drought forced the government to stop wheat exports. In Syria, where villages have been abandoned as drought withered farmlands in the area historically lauded as the so-called fertile crescent. And where 10 days ago, our largest reservoir in the United States, Lake Mead, which so-called fills the taps of millions of people across the Southwest, the water level fell lower than it's ever been since the reservoir was filled 75 years ago. And now that being green serves business as a useful double entendre, helping their bottom line, and movie stars, Bette Midler, find it a way to burnish their gloss. The question arises, how can art navigate between the sirens of social engagement and the spectacle? 
How can it contribute to a shift in environmentalist consciousness for individuals and societies while maintaining both its criticality and its visual pleasure? And we need to imagine not only new aesthetic forms uh, for art, but new ways of living post-oil. The environment, both as a sculptural and cultural construct, became an issue in the 60s as, for example, when Alan Capro made his pile of tires objects of our everyday life. In 1961, in the courtyard of the Martha Jackson Gallery, for a show significantly called Environments, Situations, Spaces, making Mertz-esque a la Schwitters, and during the same period, he was proposing improvisational happenings. That and Carl Andre's spatial environmentalism, installations that the viewer experienced by being inside and atop them, not Rachel Carson's warning about industrial chemical poisoning the water supply, propelled the earth workers to the great outdoor environment. While the critics decided, uh, desired to see earthworks as about nature, when sculptors such as Robert Smithson pictured here and Michael Heiser, whose 1968 depression is illustrated, began to work directly in the unbuilt environment, moving, er moving earth, the aspect they thought was real, raw space. Generally, nature was considered instrumentally as a new arena in which to act. Rather than considering himself in nature, Heiser remarked, I make New York art in the desert. And a few years after the Sierra Club made a fortune by fortuitously publishing Elliot Porter's lyrical landscape photographs the same year as Silent Spring, Smithson, authoritatively speaking in the voice of the first person plural that so irked others, remarked, I think we all see the landscape as coextensive with the gallery. I don't think we're dealing with matter in a back to nature movement. Fearing romantic or propagandistic simplification and wanting to maintain modernism's purity, even while investigating the relation between sight and gallery non sight practical life and modern political engagement with land use in their art were of no interest. Modernism's autonomy of the art object as a discrete sphere of experimentation and contemplation rejected the overt social message, as in Alexander Hogue's 1939 analogizing of water erosion on a Texas wheat farm as the crucified land. He condemned political incompetence and agricultural practices that resulted in the devastation across his home state. We can say that this polarized view of art as either formally inventive or socially progressive is an outdated dichotomy, except that their merging also predates modernism. Of course, this is the radical social realism of Gustave Courbet, but in the context of environmentalism, there is the exemplar of John Constable, particularly as revealed in Anne Birmingham's 1986 book. Claude Monet, in London during the Franco-Prussian War, was inspired by Constable's painterly touch, his thick stroke, and went home to become vilified by the Academy as an Impressionist. But for Constable, the impact of Britain's industrial revolution on its small land mass, particularly that of his beloved native Denham, prompted anxieties of loss. Constable's pictures of landscape and its inhabitants, both villages and trees, gave visual voice to public concern for the imminent concision of the countryside, posed by the ongoing enclosure and sale of rough lands once held in common. They were being sold to private individuals for their cultivation of trees for timber. Concurrent with the earth workers, though, another trajectory and the inspiration of today's artists was developing. Pioneers in what became known as the eco-art movement are the married duo of Newton and Helen Mayer Harrison, whose projects began in the 1970s and have evolved from a small ecosystem and a museum gallery raising crabs 
as an inexp inexpensive means to feed the world's populations, Two, sustained engagement, working uh, over 30 years with biologists, ecologists, urban planners to devise projects, initiate collaborative dialogues, such as their 2008 Greenhouse Britain. Here they propose alternatives about how people might withdraw as the waters rise what new forms of settlement might look like, and what properties a new cultural landscape might have in response to the global warming phenomenon. It also demonstrates how a city at risk might be defended. The Harrison's approach combines scientific study, urban and land use planning, cartography, and presentation of data. Their chief means of communication, after they stopped growing things in the gallery, has been intensely didactic. Okay, here, all right. Text, charts, illustrations, which could be more often effectively absorbed in a book or a website, but they are increasingly incorporating strong illustrational messages. The progenitor of today's artists engaging in direct environmental redeme remediation was the engaged critical scientism of Hans Hacke. His 1965 acrylic water and air condensation cube and his 1969 grass grows. Now, Dennis Oppenheim, you're here and you saw this. You saw, you were one, one actually saw this in person. That's, that's history. All right. Um, uh, you know, this is wow to an art historian, all right? <laughs> Here, it combines minimalist geometric elementarity and systematic process art. And he set up his Rhine water purification plant for two months for a project in Krefeld, Germany, 1972. The chemical system displayed the local sewage plant's murky efflux and treated and filtered it to efficient, sufficiently to return it to the Rhine River. On his accompanying data sheet posted in the gallery, Hakka recorded the level of untreated sewage that the city of Creefield expand, expelled into the Rhine and identified the major municipal and industrial sources. He not only performed a real-time system of pur purifying water, right, but his exposure of the perpetrators put into motion direct public and then political intervention. In addition to the Harrison's MO of the didactic proposal and Hawkes of scientific systematic sampling of direct re and direct remediation, another early mode was the monumentalized symbolic gesture. At the vacant Battery Park landfill in 1982, Agnes Dennis planted and harvested a two-acre field of wheat. The, art the artwork yielded 1,000 pounds of wheat to address what Dennis termed the human values and misplaced priorities. The harvested grain then traveled to 28 cities worldwide in an international show for the end of world hunger and was symbolically planted. And indeed, I argue that it's pre precisely the iconic quality of the image more than the environmentalist act itself that burned these works into our cultural consciousness and have maintained them and the artists in art historical memory. We can imagine Dennis' self-dramatization as performing Millet's heroic sower striding across Grant Wood's young corn. Similarly, Joseph Boyce is considered an inspiration to artists' environmentalism in the sense of bringing the public's attention to an issue through what he called participatory social sculpture. But his most famous environmental work functioned more strongly as shamanistic arboreal mysticism. For his project for the German International Exhibition Documenta, 1982, Boyce began his planting of 7,000 young oak trees throughout the greater city of Kassel as a performance situation. Posthumously, Dia continued that in front of their building in Chelsea. In numerology, the prime number seven refers to a complex duality. Each tree was paired with a columnar basalt stone, approximately four feet high, 
So each duo consisted of a living part, the tree, and a stone erection maintaining its solid mass. And since he's referring to archetypes, which can equally be viewed, uh, these can equally be viewed as a kind of primal coitus between the mythology of the feminine, seen here in the b soul of the blasted pine by the early 20th century photographer Jan uh, Anne Brigham, and the erect phallus as from an ancient Hindu temple lingam. Considering another way that women have been gendered in culture and represented in art history as a goddess of beauty, Venus, being born of the sea and mimicked in this Motorola ad, <laughs> it's remarkable that in the last 20 years or so, a number of women artists with fine art backgrounds have designed and supervised complex functioning water processing environments. Characteristic of this generation's evolution of artistic practices is the work of Betsy Damon. In the 1970s, women artists frequently reclaimed matriarchal societies for inspiration and what they considered to be an innately female power. Here is Damon on Wall Street in 1977 as a 7,000-year-old woman. Covering her body with many small colored cloths, Damon embody embodied the multi-breasted Artemis of Ephesius. Over here, Memory of Clean Water, 1985. Seven years later, on the right, 250-foot casting, handmade paper of Dry Creek Bed in Utah. Damon and assistants gathered plants, yucca, sage, rabbit, bush, willow, wild flax, cottonwood, colored clays, ground them up uh, into powder, added to paper pulp, and in the interior galleries, the solid stream of paper with rhythmical bulges and hollows, minutely capturing the rock bed surface, spans and encircled the gallery dotted with indigenous rocks and pebbles, a physical display of the river's size, the stream's force, their monumental scale in relation to the body of the viewer. And in her video augmenting the work, Damon then makes the more direct political uh, remarks uh, about um, radioactive runoff from nearby uranium mining, chemical waste from agriculture, water flowing near this riverbed was not potable, and she lectured on local issues of water use and conservation. And then from this, from feminist, uh, spiritual goddess imagery and gallery representation, here we are in 1998 in China. She started in 1991, Keepers of the Water, Citizens' Rights and Responsibilities at the University of Minnesota with the Ag School, at the Living Water Garden in the city of Chengdu in Sichuan Province, China. She built the first inner city ecological park in the world with water as its theme. Now, isn't this remarkable? This is, I'm going to show you work of women who like, got their MFA and then kept studying, kept learning, become, become, become contractors, become compatriots of scientists. The 59, uh, 5.9 no, acre public park located on two rivers. Uh, it includes a fully functioning water treatment plant, giant sculpture in the shape of a fish, living environmental education center, w refuge for wildlife and plants, uh, and uh, general uh, you know, recreation center drawing all sorts of uh, families and people as well as being functional wetlands. Patricia Johansson, another one who has a painting degree from Bennington, a MA in art history from Hunter, and then a BA in uh, architecture and civil engineering from City College. Another practitioner of complex, conceptually and physically ecological projects internationally is Patricia Johansson. 
her Fair Park Lagoon. This was her first uh, outside, uh, no, in, in Dallas. It was essentially dead when Johansson was brought in to design its revitalization. Rain washed lawn fertilizer into the murky, murky water, causing algae bloom. The shoreline was eroding. It was a five block long environmental black hole surrounded by museums. And Johnson aimed, Johansson aimed to bring people into contact with the real world through an environment that was both a viable aquatic community and a pleasing work of art. Of course, she worked with marine biologists and um, uh, plant and soil specialists to advise her, selected native Texas plants as emblems of the sculpture, used the plant form for her sculptural motif so that the root structure of the delta duck potato uh, becomes her uh, sculptural uh, um, motif and between all of these reddish paths one can get right in, right above the water to observe fish plants and birds and then went on to do a uh, work at the San Francisco uh, Percent for Art, uh, commissioned by the Percent for Art, for their sewage treatment plant just south of Candlestick Park. You can visit this. Uh, it's right between the San Francisco airport and the city. And again, she uses a local um, motif. Here we have the San Francisco garter snake, and it is depicted depicted in the pavement and in, the, uh, in the, sh the shape of the grasses. This is also a butterfly uh, and perfumed uh, garden. And she says, endangered garden here is art as activism. It fills in ecological gaps with food and habitat actually making it possible for species to, that have been wiped out to come back. Combining art with public recreation and enjoyment, the site is also an educational opportunity. It presents visitors with a miniature world that integrates snakes, birds, butterflies, worms, human life, and intertidal life. On her latest large project, uh, north of San Francisco, Petaluma, and she lives here in the Hudson Valley. It's just coincidental that the San Franciscans, the, the Californians, are very open to, to this $140 million water recycling facility that she really was, was the head of with an engineering firm, team, including oxidation ponds, sewage treatment, wetlands, polishing ponds for the remo removal of heavy metals, a new 272-acre tidal marsh, mud flat, uh, Petaluma Wetlands Park, and again, to make the the form accessible and local. Here, she uses a the one of the area's smallest inhabitants, the small the salt marsh harvest mouse. Okay. There it is, and here, and here, 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 it's, here here's the kind of the form over here. More than three miles of public trails and interpretive sites trace the pattern of the creature, while revealing the intricacies of wastewater treatment, tidal cycle, ever-changing patterns of land and water, complex relationships of microhabitats and ecosystems. So what does imagery have to do with a water treatment plant? It makes it comprehensible. It brings it back to human scale. Many of the artists working on large outdoor projects are insufficiently recognized because they do not produce portable work. Jackie Bruckner is one who does, making sculpture that functions both as prototypes and as gallery or residential scale work. Here's her gallery scale, but still humongous. Prima linga, first tongue, first language. It would be grotesque, except that it's also gorgeous, particularly in this photograph. No two artists. Biosculptures are Bruckner's trademark term for biogeochemical filters. 
stone and concrete structures laden with mosses, ferns, and other plants to purify water. Fishes, snails, all sorts of other ewe things are in uh, among the organisms living in the water to enrich these sculptural ecosystems. Whereas over here we have views of a project in Germany, Gift of Water, commissioned by a town, functions as part of a filtration system for a public swimming complex. So we use this sort of thing in here, as well as wetlands, grasslands, and here the bio sculpture is in the form of two cupped hands. Okay. The mossy cupped hands here, made out of a um, kind of fiber, durable texture, textile, with a misting fountain here that, that encourages the growth of the moss, and the purifying mosses, recall this kind of open palm, recall slightly, okay, open palm here toward the earth, the Buddhist mudra, or symbolic gesture of virada, for charity, symbolizing the fulfillment of all wishes. And here is Lillian Ball's sculpture. She also makes gallery work down here, okay, is a sculpture with video animations on a disc of ice called 66 degrees, 32 minutes, 50 years, projects the rapidly changing Arctic ice cap into the future, 1990 to 2040, 2040. It is a story told of ice on ice as the dwindling ice cap um, maps are animated and projected on a carved ice arctic circle. So simultaneously the ice does disappear in the course of the exhibition, enacting the narrative. In contrast to that Ill illustrative imagination, her water wash here is a functional environmental work that unlike others here it did not respond to a call for proposals. She originated it in a Matuitak uh, Inlet, Lo uh, um, Long Island Sound. It replaced asphalt paving adjacent to a public boat ramp that regularly flooded during the storms with beneficially graded and attractively curving permeable pavement. Okay, the, the water goes, is absorbed and goes through the pavement. Permeable pavement made of, out of a particular kind of glass and glass and uh, synthetic materials framed by native grasses, wetland plants, and seeding. Here again is an environmental artist as an administrator, project manager, and negotiator with a multitude of agencies, funding sources, and schools to provide volunteers to clean and maintain the site, and, and as an educator with her informative signage, okay, which is over here, and serving as overall fixer. Is that sort of utilitarian construction that makes me wonder if the poetry of art could be washed out in a flood of artists' ecological pragmatism. The recent zenith of that approach is Eve Mosher's high water line, social action drawing of a chalk line made with a wheeled machine used in athletic fields to demarcate a point 10 feet above sea level. So she traveled around Brooklyn and Manhattan saying this is, what, this is where is going to be 10 feet above sea level uh, in a major storm that Mm, could be, is uh, supposed to be once every 100 years, but it's, probably, it's going to be about once every 19 years on average by 2050. Uh, she trod around Brooklyn and Manhattan, marking the line uh, that her re research with the Goddard Institute had provided her. She spoke with a few people, maybe making them realize that somebody was taking global warming seriously and was concerned. Clever. Admirable, 
brought a lot of attention to flooding potential and the global warming. Okay, but I wonder if art forgoes the formal to become pure subject matter, whether utilitarian or ethical statement, what is the difference between it and the project to paint heat reflective white paint on roofs by our local Atlantic chapter of the Sierra Club? This kind of activist environmentalist work demonstrates either an indifference or an outright rejection of attention to visual experience. And yes, I mean capital A aesthetics. Fearing that it means degenerating to the condition of Kuhn's, that is, of consumption. And this object, this object, okay, was chosen to be plopped outside the first World Trade Center building to have been rebuilt and opened, number five. All right. I don't want to be lectured to in environmentalist art. And neither do I want to be just distracted by gleam. All right? I am thinking of aesthetics as articulated by Jacques Rancière in his Politics of Aesthetics in the sense of Schelling's system of transcendental idealism. All right, Cabro would be rolling over in his grave thinking that we're applying transcendental idealism to him, but system of transcendental idealism, a union of conscious and unconscious processes, as quoted by Rancière, that comes from and calls upon the imagination. Art that literally in the public realm or not lets me in calls upon my participation in reflection and interpretation and de demands it to fully receive the art. This quandary of what artness has to do with environmentalism, our topic, or more broadly, of how to make socially engaged art is not new. It might not even be more pressing than it was during the Nazis' rise to power. When Walter Benjamin wrote in 1934 Paris, I should like to demonstrate to you, in the, in the essay, the author as producer, that tendency of a work of literature to be politically correct only works if it's also correct in the literary sense. In other words, it is directly concerned with literary technique, Benjamin said. Of course, in our postmodern period, we no longer privilege formal experimentation, the radical newness of form, preferably abstract. And our environment situation spaces have changed since Capro made his wacky, joyful jumble of tires. Things of the everyday world in the spring of 1961, a few months after JFK announced in his inaugural address that the torch had been passed to a new generation of Americans born in this century. Now, Edward Bernieski's Mound of Tires here, addresses a sadder condition of consumption, waste, and the burden of garbage. Bernieski's portraits of ships being broken up in China implicitly speak to the 19th century mercantile power of huge coal-driven steamships, such as the famously pictured Le Leviathan in Robert Howitt's 19, uh, 1857 photograph, the largest ship to be on water at the time, 1857. Brunieski has remarked, our dependence on nature to provide the materials for our consumption and our concern for the health of our planet sets us into an uneasy contradiction. Materials for consumption, 
concern for health. A planet. For me, Bernieski says, these images function as reflecting pools of our times. And I think they also function as environmentalist art. In considering a green aesthetic, an increasing number of artists now strive for what French theorist Félix Guattari identified in 1989 as an ethico-political articulation, ecosophie, between three ecological registers, the environment, social relations, and human subjectivity. The more pronounceable, I don't know whether it's I don't know anyone who knows whether it's ecosophy or ecosophy or what. The more pronounceable term for that, increasing, increasingly gaining traction, is seeking environmental justice. Fairness in the use and distribution of environmental resources is sought not only for all species, but all economic and social strata. In the past decade, the American photographer and now occasional columnist on Huffington Post, Souvenir Banerjee, has self-funded long seasons in the American Arctic. Banerjee portrays the Arctic as a focal point for global warming, migration of birds and caribous, and resource wars, the title of a exhibition he has now in the Midwest. Many of his pictures illustrate the relationship that the Gwich'in communities of Alaska here and the Canadian Yukon have with the Porcupine River caribou herd and their human rights struggle to preserve the calving grounds of the caribou, caribou, the coastal plain of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge from oil and gas development. And how do these resource wars really enter my consciousness? By their images, they shall be known. Banerjee's work aims to stimulate protective environmental action, yet his means is to move viewers by merging informative realism, dynamic compositions, and the kind of beauty that philosopher Edmund Burke called the sublime. In their capturing of the sublime's qualities of vastness, obscurity, and solitude, they are exceptionally compelling, even though this is an aerial view of the migration of the caribou. Likewise, the photographs of Sasha Bezobov of the tsunami in India and a wildfire in Plumas National Forest, California, shift between the horrifying and the beautiful. Just as the charred timber and pine needles on the forest floor calls up abstract expressionism's merging of field and gesturalism, and also then beneath it suggests Busabov's good art historical education at SUNY and Purchase, while well, we also recognize this as the ravages of a fire. I will conclude with a couple of projects that I appreciate for encompassing Guattari's ecosophy, or what I would describe as engaged environmentalism and attention to visual presence, such that the viewer's both rational and imaginative participation are engaged themselves. At the 2007 documenta, Viennese artist Inez Duchek addressed a new form of colonialism by multinational corporations. Biopiracy. And Duchak's Siegel's Garden, Victory Gardens, the seed packets sprouting for her flower from her flower bed criticize the biopolitics of the EU and the US for turning a blind eye on ruthless economization of nature and life. On the front of those packets, photo collages so show lush, oversized blossoms with sexualized figures, calling up Gauguin's fantasy of primitivist eroticism, 
or satires of corporate types such as this man with the Monsanto logo, the corporation which holds a lock on patents for seeds that industrial farming needs. On the back, descriptions of actual examples of Western industrial nations' practices of acquiring property rights on valuable genetic resources without financial compensation and the ensuing global exploitation, genetic engineering, and monoculture inform viewers of the conditions and consequences of biopiracy. Now, one minute, and we'll have... The career of sculptor Mary Miss offers a succinct recapitulation of environmental sculptures changing relation as environmentalists. In 1973, she deployed multiple wood constructions across the flat breadth of the Hudson River landfill. The circular cutouts framed and focused the white expanse into an immense inner space. While their progressive descent calls up both sequential and cyclical time. Mrs. Land Art Public Rec Recreational Area for the Des Moines Art Center in Iowa, 1989 to 96, is a 7.5 acre piece including a pond, wetland grasses, overhanging walkways, ramps, pilings, wood structures. Paths lead the viewer to multiple ways of seeing the place. Movement is a key to the experience of the project. The visitor constructs an understanding of the site through experiencing the multiple elements and the relations created between them. For a museum exhibition, Weather Report, Artists respond to climate change. At Boulder, Colorado in 2007, Mrs. Project, Connecting the Dots, Mapping the High Water Hazards and History of Boulder Creek, powerfully illustrated the potential danger of climate change in the immediate locale. Paired by the local eco-arts eco organization with a geologist and a hydrologist, they projected the worst case water levels of Boulder Creek, which winds through town, and considered the scenario of an extreme flash flood that statistically should occur only every 500 years, but could happen anytime. Miss distinguished herself as an experienced artist by designing a deceptively simple outdoor installation. She placed blue metal discs for which she paid 29 cents for painted paint can lids on trees, fences, bridges, and building facades to signal the potential height of the water. It would rise up to 19 feet above the steam, stream bed. She and student assistants painted blue dots on the sidewalk to indicate the span. Okay, there's the span, and the, one, the, oh, and the higher ones indicate the height. All right. Artistically, the work was satisfying for its visual as well as physical economy. The effect of seeing the simple bright dots overhead and realizing that one would be swept away by the rapidly coursing flood was immediate and gripping. This is my photograph. I, I, I was very, very moved by this. I'm, I'm sure you can tell. All those blue dots can be read as bubbles, of course, or in their roundness as drum heads, as drum beats, bell gongs, or water torture drop. Drop, drop, relentless reminders overhead, drop, 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 that the waters are rising, drop, 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 so as to not let attention to the environmental crisis, drop. Thank you. Thank you.